So let me tell you what I'm going to talk about, and you tell me if you have any edits. Okay, so I thought I'd start with the story of ProFounder, give you a little context about how, crowd, how crowdfunding for us came to being, why it's important, how the product works, how crowdfunding in, in general works, the case studies of how it's been successful, tips to make it more successful, how this fits into the big picture of funding, and then end with the biggest picture, which is what's happening in Washington now to make crowdfunding even more progressive than it is. Any suggestions of things to be added to that that you guys like? To All right, you're easy, awesome. So the idea for crowdfunding came to us um, in the form of ProFounder. It came to us in August 2009. My co-founder is Jessica Jackley. She started Kiva before this, which is a peer-to-peer -peer lending site. So it's very deep experience in this field. And we saw a very interesting case study unfolding around us. We saw two of our classmates in business school that wanted to raise money from fellow classmates. And there was about 300 of us in the class, and they sent out an email to 300 people and said, listen, we're about to graduate. You all know we're starting this business. You've seen, seen it develop over the last two years. Is there anyone that wants to invest? You know, no pressure, $1,000 max each. We just want people to be part of this journey with us. We don't lose touch and can stay in this together. In 24 hours, 60 people responded and said, I'm in. It seemed like it should be something that was on the brochure for our, for our school for the rest of perpetuity of how amazingly strong the community was. Uh, but that was not the case at all because they went to their lawyers the next day and they said, guess what? Great news. 60 of our friends want to invest. No way you're crazy. Not going to happen. Do these people have student debt? Yeah, they do. Um, yeah, that's not going to happen because we learned the term accredited investor and unaccredited investor. Our classmates had less than a million dollars in net worth, which puts them into this category called unaccredited investors. And it's very difficult if you're an unaccredited investor to invest in private businesses as opposed to public companies or investing with the help of a broker dealer or investment advisor to be able, ma able to make your own investment decisions is very challenging. So they pushed and pushed with their lawyers and said, you've got to figure this out. We're paying you the big bucks. Make it happen. And their lawyers spent four months and $20,000 looking for a solution. And eventually, they found a way that 35 classmates could contribute $35,000. And that, to us, was just mind-blowing to see that kind of inefficiency in a marketplace. You could have entrepreneurs doing great things, <coughs> investors that want to support them. And for some crazy reason, they just could not get together. Classic market inefficiency, right? We really saw an opportunity to help there. And first, we just wanted to help our friends. We were doing completely separate things and thought this was just a side project to help some buddies. But the more we dug into this problem, the more we realized the real scale that it had and just how many people it could truly help create access to capital for if we could crack this code and crack this problem. And the more we dug in, we saw stats like $144 billion a year trades hands in these informal investment markets between friends and family. And then I started to look at it from a new perspective. Oh, friends and family investing. That's interesting. My family had a garbage business from Italy. We had a number of small businesses. And all of them were started around the dinner table, aunts, uncles, and friends chipping in to make these things happen. And that's this informal economy that has billions of dollars dwarfing the VC industry that's really getting business off the ground. But yet nobody ever talks about it. It's not sexy. Nobody wants to talk about friends and family contributing to businesses. So there's never any innovation there. So that's why we saw an even bigger opportunity to bring innovation to this stodgy market. So we thought about this case study, and we dug in with our lawyers for a whole year. And we found a very dusty set of securities laws that are very complex, so nobody ever utilizes. And we said, complexity is not an issue for us. That's what technology is for. We can make complex things simple and therefore make them usable. So we found a securities exemption, which was very complex and confusing and never used because every state using this securities exemption got to make their own rules. So the lawyers said, we don't even want to touch this. This is crazy. If you use this rule, that means that we need our paralegals spending hours looking up what happens if you have an investor from Alabama plus one from New York, and then you have an international person that have to take into account all these dynamic rules. Forget it. I don't even want to deal with it. But that's what we were able to solve with technology, where you can just put in your investors and all the laws spit out, and they dynamically integrate to if you have someone here and here, here's what you need to do. Here's the document you need to file. Here's how many investors you could have to take out all that expensive legal work that we saw our classmates need to do. So we developed a platform where you could create a pitch. You could create term sheets. We learned a lot from our customers early on. We learned that. Whereas in the VC industry, we started in Silicon Valley and everyone was doing equity deals, but a lot of our customers didn't want equity deals, didn't want to give up control, didn't understand how to value their company, it didn't seem appropriate, didn't understand how that could provide liquidity to potential investors. So we wanted to think creatively about possible structures. So in addition to having equity terms, we also offered revenue sharing terms, where you could share a percentage of your revenue over a fixed period of time. And what's so great about this is you don't give up any control in your business. Nobody else is an owner. They're buying into your revenue stream, but not your business. So it's still all yours. It's also over a fixed period of time. It's not indefinite, good or bad. Eventually, it's over. 
Um, and that was all very appealing to people. So we offered those two term sheets. Most people did choose that, that royalty agreement. And then we gave people private fundraising websites where you can invite your community members, which means friends, family, classmates, colleagues, etc., to be able to invest directly through the site. And you had the compliance calculator to easily see the implications from a regulatory perspective about what that meant. So that's what the product looked like. Some of the case studies that we saw of how this was actually used in practice really blew us away. So we did see this classmate-to-classmate -classmate example happen a few times. To give you some context, another piece of the rule, not only did we have these state-by-state -state laws to integrate, it can also raise less than a million dollars, which a lot of other people said, less than a million dollars, who wants to do that? Guess what, that's everybody. It's <laughs> rare that you need more than a million dollars to get your business off the ground unless you're doing medical devices, right? So that really fit the bill for us. And you also, another piece of the rule is that you had to reach out to people you had a substantial pre-existing relationship with. That's the SEC's word. So basically people you know. And that also had turned people off before because they said, oh, no, I don't know anybody with money. I need to reach out to those rich strangers. But guess what? That's not where the funding comes from. This $144 billion, that's from people you know. And it does not necessarily that you need one rich uncle. Um, what crowdfunding allows is that you have a few friends who want to put in smaller amounts. And that's how you're able to reach out. And thinking more creatively about, it's not just people who sit around the dinner table with you, it's your classmates, it's your colleagues, it's your customers. It's the people you know in all of these various circles who you want to bring into the venture. So some examples. We had a sneaker company that two classmates started out of college. In fact, they started making these sneakers by hand, drawing on vans in school. And their classmates would always stop them and say, those are so cool, I want a pair. How can I get a pair? And eventually they said, we should make a business out of this. This is awesome. And who are the people who've been our biggest supporters all along and keep telling us they want to buy these sneakers? Our classmates. So they raised $65,000 from 25 classmates. And with that money, they did their first production run of sneakers. Six months later, they sold out. And then they went on to raise angel capital to do their next run and scale up the business from there. And they've been, they've been very successful since. So that's one example. Another example that we love to talk about is a company called Cubic Motors in San Francisco that makes these electric motorcycles, that are really cool high-tech racing motorcycles. And so for them, they were getting money from, from angel investors, but they were angel investors who didn't, didn't really know motorcycles. These were real motorcycle guys. They were starting this business because they loved the bikes. It wasn't just about the money for them. Um, and they said, but our, you know, our investors don't know that much about bikes. Uh, how are they going to be able to contribute on the product side? What if the people we ride with on the weekends could invest in our business as well? And they had 15 of competitive motorcycle riders that they rode with invest in their business as well. And talk about redefining what strategic investor means. You can't get much more strategic than fellow competitive motorcycle riders for motorcycle business. They've since been featured in motorcycle magazines because the famous riders are riding their bikes. In addition to allowing these people to invest, they said, invest and we'll throw in a free bike as well if you invest over a certain amount. And it was perks like that that was very, very meaningful to this pool of investors. A third example is Fargo Brewing Company, a brewery, a small microbrewery that started in Fargo. And they really wanted to be a community center, a place where everyone would, would go to hang out at this brewery. So they wanted local investors because they know that if they had people, local people investing in this brewery, they would be so proud to bring people there and say, hey, let's go to this brewery for dinner. Also, I invested in it. I'm part of this. This is part of me. And seeing that pride was something that was very common to a lot of the case studies we saw is that investors were not only investing for cash, not only investing for that outcome, they were investing for the pride of being part of something. They loved being able to tell people that they had invested in this. That brewery, you know, they, they haven't been, um, they, you know, they just have a small amount of revenue so far and they're already starting to pay out on their revenue stream. Talk to any of the investors and what they're most excited about is they can walk in on a Saturday night, a table's always ready for them, they get a free beer, they can bring their friends, they're over the moon. So these are the, the type of case studies that we see. Some tips of what made it more successful, why these three folks were among the most successful of people that we saw, is they weren't random about it. They were highly strategic. So the motorcycle people said, there's a reason that we want to do this. The reason is we want to get motorcycle enthusiasts in the door. We're not just scraping for cash anywhere. We know who we want to get involved. So maybe it's someone who says, I want my supplier to invest in me because I think I can get better deal, a better deal on these raw materials if this person's also an investor because then they'll have skin in the game. So let's figure out a way to get that supplier involved, and this is the most efficient way to do so. So they were very strategic about that. They're also very authentic about their goals and sharing their story. They, they did little videos where they talked for a few minutes about why they were doing this and why it was so important to them. 
and the people who are investing really want to be a part of your story. They don't want some cold, hard, um, you know, 50 pages of business plan that you just FedEx to their house. That's not exciting. That's not why they're investing. They want to know you. They want to know your story. Maybe they want to live vicariously through you as an entrepreneur, because entrepreneurship is not something that they'll do themselves, but they appreciate those values and they want to be part of it. And by telling your story and showing your passion so authentically, you get to bring people in that way. We also saw the most successful entrepreneurs offered more than just a cash reward. They respected their investors and really brought them in, in the good times and the bad. For example, we had a candy shop in Hawaii that raised $50,000 from 19 investors. And not only did they ask their investors what flavor of shaved ice they should launch with and let them vote and be a part of that experience, but when the construction wasn't going on time and they weren't going to be able to open on the date that they had promised and was so important to their pitch, they immediately told their investors, construction's not going well, we're really having trouble with this contractor. An investor immediately stepped up and found a new general contractor and they were able to open on time in the end. I think it's a real testament to their vulnerability and sharing weakness and sharing challenge with their investors as well and respecting the fact that they will step forward and they will contribute if need be. So just some, some examples of success tips. Where this fits into the big picture, so I don't see crowdfunding as the end-all, be-all of funding solutions, but I see it as a part of a long line of ways that you could get funding and it could fit into a timeline. So for example, the most common way that any business is funded is through your own money. Either the money in your pocket or the money that comes off your credit card. Personal credit cards, <laughs> the, the way that everyone gets started, right? But the thing that usually comes right after that is your friends and family. And what's being innovated on there is now crowdfunding is seeping in and kind of taking some of that friends and family and creating its own new marketplace in that piece of the timeline. The next thing is usually a bank loan or angel capital, and then you have your VC capital or more, um, more loans. And what we've seen so far happening were lines of credit on the, the far end. So what we've seen happening so far is how people are leveraging their crowdfunding to get to the next step. So for example, we've heard people who've gone to angels and say, and, and do a pitch, and the angel said, you know, you're, you're not quite ready yet. And so they pushed on, well, what would make me ready? What do I need to get there? And they said, you don't have a prototype. Okay. Well, I know I need 20K to build this prototype. Why don't I let my community fund that portion? I'll then get that prototype, and then I'll go back to the angel. We've had people who talked to banks for loans, and they didn't have the collateral to put up. They raised that collateral from their community, and then they went on to get the bank loan. So repeatedly, we see this step-by-step -step process happening. Um, the, the thing I want to leave you with, which is so exciting, is the context of where crowdfunding sits in the economy today and what's going on. And I don't know how much you've seen about this dialogue and this discourse unfolding in Washington, but President Obama talked a lot about the jobs bill and creating more access to capital for entrepreneurs to therefore create more jobs as a result of new businesses being started. Um, and as part of that speech, one of the things that he mentioned was that crowdfunding is one of the things that is going to bring the economy forward, create that access to capital, create those jobs. And that was an unbelievable thing to hear coming from that level. The next day, a bill dropped in the House, allowing crowdfunding to happen in a way that is just unprecedented and hasn't been able to happen before. What I described to you is a way that we were able to kind of, kind of duct tape it together with all of the existing tools, right? Take the 50 states of, of laws and make them as easy as possible to navigate, let you access your own community. And that has been successful. But what this would allow you to do is take it to the next step. What this bill allows is for fully open public marketplaces, for entrepreneurs to be able to list their opportunities, for anyone in the public to be able to seize any social media tool that you so desire to market that deal, have an unlimited number of investors, up to a million dollars, be able to invest with caps on the individual investments. That passed through the Financial Services Committee by unanimous vote, which never happens. It passed in the House 404 to 17, again, a margin that is never seen. It's being hotlined to the Senate, so it's going to go to the floor of the Senate for a vote and is looking quite, um, quite confident that'll pass. So certainly not a sure thing, but the momentum is really, really exciting to see. And to give you an idea of the scale of this, this is a change to the Securities Act of 1933 that has not happened since the 30s. I mean, this is akin to recreating the stock market. This is an unbelievable opportunity right now and an amazing time to be an entrepreneur, amazing time to be starting a business and be accessing types of capital and, and new innovative ways of financing that were never available before.